Thank you, Marcy, for that scripture reading. Let's get our Bibles out and say this together. This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. I want us to look at a second part of why singing matters. I want to read a little bit of what Marcy read because the last phrase is what I'm looking for. But yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his, wor and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. When I read that phrase, and it's not the first time I've read the phrase, but when I, I read it, do you, do you notice anything that seems odd? And it's all perspective, and you can't read my mind, and that's probably a good thing. But I want you to think about this. Whenever Jesus began his ministry, it wasn't time to die. And so everything he said was, shh, don't say anything. He, he didn't do a lot, but as he began to do miracles and things, he said, shh, listen to this. Mark, Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Again, Jesus heals a little girl and he gave strict orders. Do not tell anyone about this. What's different? You know, the Samaritans disliked the Jews, or, or Jews disliked the Samaritans, maybe even hated them. But they're hundreds of miles from any hating Jew, Jews. And so Jesus just lays it out before the lady, and she gets it. She connects all the dots. When he says to her, go call your husband, and she said, I don't have one. He said, you're right, you've had five and the man you're living with is not yours. From that moment on, that woman connected every dot that Jesus laid before him as to who he was. In fact, she becomes in just a moment of time, one who goes and tells what Jesus has done for her. I want us to look at this. This is one of the key verses for today. God is spirit. It comes from the Greek word pneuma. God is spirit and his worshipers, basically those who prostrate themselves, must worship again in spirit, pneuma, and in aletheia, truth. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? The word worshiper means to literally or figuratively fall flat on your face. You are in reverence. You are in awe of the living God. Our reverent response to God must be both in truth and in spirit. That's what's God, that, that is what God is looking for. The word truth or aletheia means something who's genuine. Something who is absolutely real. There's no fakeness involved in it at all. So when he says, I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth, I want you to be real. I want you to be genuine. Don't put on a facade. 
word spirit, we're going to come back in just a moment and define it in greater detail. Now, the Father is a spirit, the Son is a spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives us sort of a definition of the unity of the Godhead, or sometimes we call them the Trinity. God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit are absolutely, totally united in purpose and who they are. John made two statements before. We studied this just recently in 1 John. God is light and God is love. He says here, God is spirit. I think maybe those three phrases, and I, I would probably change what I put on the slide, but I think they sort of get us into the area of understanding deity. God is spirit. God is light. And God is love. John is not defining in verse 24, he's not defining the essence of God as much as he is talking about a different order, the difference in man, flesh, and God, spirit. There's a distinction, and he makes it here. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's come from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. It's interesting. There's a little play on words in our English doesn't do it justice. But both words are translated from the Greek word pneuma, which means wind and spirit. They mean the same thing. Jesus is looking at the, the spirit, which is invisible. He's talking about the blowing of the wind, which is also invisible. By, by the way, which one of those do we control? The spirit or the wind? Neither. We don't, we don't control any of them, but he's making a huge distinction and telling us something that's important. Nicodemus is not connecting the dots. You should not be surprised at my saying. Now, that's what Jesus said. I'm going to go with it. What should Nicodemus have known? Who is Nicodemus? He is a leader of the Jewish nation. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, none of this should really surprise you. Now, I'm going to pick out two scriptures, and it's not fair because Nicodemus didn't have my computer and I could type it in. But I, I, something like this, I think, is what Jesus expected him to have in his mind. I will spring, speaking of, from Ezekiel about the future, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all the impurities and from all the idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and carefully keep my laws. This one, I think, should have been, especially right here in Joel, the next one should have been, well, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Peter quotes from this in Acts chapter 2. Now, should, the, should Nicodemus have known this? Jesus thinks that he should have. There shouldn't have been this huge surprise, but what might have caused this? Do you suppose that maybe somewhere along the way they stopped teaching? Maybe they had changed 
the focus on what was important. Maybe they just sort of looked forward to this Messiah coming, but they really didn't think too much about it. I mean, after all, he didn't come 100 years after the last prophet, 200 years, 300, 400 years after the last prophet. He still hasn't come. Maybe he's not coming. That's sort of what some people think about Jesus. You know, his, his final return, he, he's not coming. I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Only people, church, that are born of water and the Spirit receive the Spirit and can truly worship God in spirit. It's real important. I'm, I don't... Well, I want to read it again. Only people born of the water and spirit. Only those have the capacity to receive the spirit and worship God in spirit and be genuine in that worship. What does it mean to be born of the water and the spirit? What does the birth of the water and spirit do? Here's the urgency. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches for the very first time a message about Jesus. And he's, he spent some time going back in the Old Testament and bringing it up to the crucified Christ at that moment. A fact that everyone in Jerusalem would have known. And when he gets down to a certain point, he says this. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Lord means the one who's in control of everything. If you put a capital K on that and said it in that day, they, you would have thought you were talking about a Caesar. But he is Lord, and he's also the a chosen one or the anointed one. So I want you to know, I want all of Israel to know that you crucified this Jesus. Now, I, Jerry chapter 994, I don't think Peter is saying in that, that every one of you that I'm speaking to in this group were involved in the crucifixion. Someone said to me one time, do you suppose if Jesus were here we would crucify him all again. You ever think if you were there that day in the crowd, I mean, if my mouth had got going, I would have been a holler, crucify him, crucify him. He's an imposter. But the people hear this from Peter. He's, he's made this argument and they say this. They're cut to the heart. They're just ripped wide open and said to Peter and the other apostles, what are we going to do about this? I mean, we've crucified. If you, if you crucified the Lord of glory, is there not some guilt? Is there not sin? Do you not feel it? Here's the answer. It's very simple. He says, to your answer of what to do, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two things. The first one has to happen before the second. Well, first you got to repent. You know, uh, she's not in here so I can talk about her. Samantha's teaching me a lot about choices. She's here. Oh, she, she just came in. The, that's all right. She's teaching me a lot about choices. We have to make choices in life. Some of them I've made are really bad. Uh, some of them are good. But when you repent, when you change, it's not like 180 degrees. When you and I repent of any sin that has been in our life for a while, 
it takes time to make that change. But the conviction is, God, I'm going to change. And he says, when you've done that, be baptized into Christ. And what do you get? Come on, what do you get? Forgiveness of sin. And you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you want to read the rest of that, it says it's to you and to your children and all of us today. Why the need to be born again of the water and the spirit? Until that takes place, there is no connection that enables me to worship God in spirit and in truth. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. A lot. I've made a bunch in worshiping God. There are people today who, all across the country, some on the other part of the world that is already Sunday night over there, they've been worshiping God for all kinds of reasons and all kinds of things. But if I don't have a connection to the Christ, I cannot worship him. I don't get any joy out of saying that. When I'm born of the water and the spirit, my worship then, because my sin is gone and I now have the spirit, I will be able to truthfully, honestly, genuinely worship the Christ. Also, I need to get rid of any sin that I'm aware of, and it could be between brother or sister, but whatever it is before I worship. I lived at a little place one time. Gosh, nearly 50 years ago. And I was going through an old church directory and I was asking, I said, so who is this? This person moved and this one died. Who is this? Well, she lives across the street. Well, I've been here for a month. How come she isn't here? Well, she said, as long as so-and-so is in the building, she's never coming back to that church. And I remember thinking, wow, I didn't have all the theological arguments, you know, <laughs> That Larry, that I, I may have wanted to use, but I'm like, this sounds really not good. And I remember as a young man, I was thinking, you know, so she doesn't want to worship with this person because she thinks they're a hypocrite. And yet, if she doesn't change the desire of her heart, she's going to go to hell and live with the hypocrites forever. And I come in here, I... I, I, we, we came in here and just remembered this sacrifice of Christ for our sin, his resurrection. He stands at the right hand of God. And I want this relationship so much. But if I don't have this relationship, I won't have this one. I know you've heard it before, but I'm going to say it again because I need to keep it in front of me. Jesus said, therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother and come and offer your gift. I'll never get over this verse because every time I read it, 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 it shocks me and do. And it doesn't say, if you remember that you have something against your brother. If you remember your brother has something against you, Get it fixed. Is it easy? Easy, there wouldn't be any Ukraine-Russian wars and all the garbage going on. If I'm coming to the assembly and in our corporate worship today, God is here. I want to be prepared to worship him, and I don't want the ball and chains of things that I've had in my life keep dragging them on, dragging them on. And all it's doing is dragging me down. 
I need to stop and humble myself. I need to prostrate myself. I need to fall flat on my face. I've had a hard time, and I said it last week, and I won't repeat it, except I'm having a hard time living in this sewer. And so I, I'm finding when I get, Jerry gets all churning inside with Jerry, I've got to stop. Humble myself. Flatten myself in my heart before God. I'm not saying don't take a stand. But sometimes what I feel in my heart is beyond the stand I should take. It's hard to be humble. When I want something or I feel strongly about something, it is so hard. It is the hardest thing in the world for me to humble myself. And I don't know why that is. These things we're talking about, these kinds of hearts, these are the worshipers that God is seeking. God is actually seeking worshipers. He's looking for them. You know, it's not too difficult to argue about whether the words of a song are, are important or even the, the sounds made from the notes are appropriate. They, they need to be appropriate. You know, maybe like somebody scratching on a blackboard. But I wonder if it's possible to just worship sound. I was watching some clips this week, and I ran onto one guy, and he was doing his stuff, and he said, Ain't interested in them words, just interested in that music. Twang, twang, twang. Twang, 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 twang. After a while, I'm like, okay, I've got it. Is it possible to worship the words? I don't know. Is it helpful to learn the words? The songs? You know, some of us try to do this on Wednesday night. We sometimes sing things beyond probably our ability or what we should and by the way if you're in the other class this is this is no condemnation or a slap in any way that you're not in there singing you're where you need to be I'm just saying that sometimes we need to make preparation I think there's something I could learn from the Old Testament the Old Testament priests had a lot to do in order that worship could take place for the children of Israel there's the huge bird altar had to be kept going. The fire could never go out. If the fire went out, the consecration that was between Israel and God was gone. There was the table of presence with the 12 loaves of bread. There was the seven, the, the seven candle lampstand. There was the altar of Bronze altar where they offered incense. You say, hey, Mac, I got a good deal on, on incense, 298 down here. We'll just put it in there. Really? I don't think so. Because where, where does that thing stand? That thing stands in the curtain. By the way, you had, to, you had to deal with all these things. All these things had to be clean. And that bronze altar right back there in the very back, that curtain is viewed as porous. Who's behind the curtain? God, and what's he doing when you burn the incense? And so all of that just got you ready to worship. And then when you got ready, well, two chapters say you get a young bullock without blemish, a, a kid without a goat, with, a male without blemish, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, a lamb without a blemish, and on and on. What's the common denominator? Without blemish. God doesn't want you looking through the flock and going, hey, I'm going to die in a day or two. Let's just get it out of here. What if you couldn't afford one of these? Well, you could offer a couple turtle doves, a couple pigeons, whatever. 
But suppose you couldn't do that. Suppose you didn't have that ability. God said, I'll tell you what. You go get some of that wheat and you refine it into this grain and you make it into this little patty and you bring it over to the priest and he'll burn that on the altar. And when I smell that, that will be a sweet savor of your worship to me. There was no one who wasn't able to worship God. Bottom line, give your best. Now, I'm not equating give your best there with wear a three-piece suit. I'm talking about worship to God. Give him your best. Everything that I have that I can give to God, it needs to be my best, not my second best. If I can come in here and only hum loudly, I need to hum loudly. If I need to sing at times when Mike needs a song, I mean, they need to be, by the way, thank you for the songs this morning, Mike. I need, to, I need to be quiet sometimes, and sometimes I need to let it all go. Not because of me. This is because the king is in our midst. Do you believe that? I don't think you do. In teaching boys song leading, one well, of the highlights of my year, that's about all I'm capable of is teaching these boys. But I tell them, you know, we're going to start you out learning how to pitch the song. And we're going to turn, we're going to show you how to beat time. But one of these days, when you become a worship leader, we don't need just the pitch and we don't need a metronome. We need you to lead us in worship. I asked some of my fellow teachers at the school, so how long do you spend? You, you do this regularly, right? Yeah, how, how long do you spend? Oh, eight or ten hours a week. The average was nine hours of the people that I asked. I said, so what do you do all that time? Well, first thing I want to know is the song. Why is that important? Well, I don't need my head stuck in the book. I was teasing over, we were singing Friday night. We had a great singing, by the way. If you weren't there, you missed. We had a great singing in the Exeter. And I said, how, do, how many of you know, I know that my, and everybody raised their hands. We got ready to sing what they do. I know that my Redeemer lives. You've been singing it for 50 years for crying out loud. Do you really need to read the book? Now, if you need to, forgive me. But if you don't sing, sorry, sing. We're not looking with deep admiration at, at our gifts or they weren't either. They weren't saying, isn't, isn't this a nice goat, Joel? It, it, my goat's better than your goat or my sheep's better than your sheep. This was like, I get to give this. I get to give this as a gift to God. It's the best one. I get to do that. You and I need to make deliberate choices in our hearts to participate. We need to constantly remember that making music in the heart is not about us. The prayers this morning, the Lord's Supper, the singing, that was not, none of this is about us. This preaching is not about us. This is about the Christ. Do we get a benefit from it? Yes. The only thing would have been better if I'd have been up here jumping on the stage singing with Mike. A few ideas I want to help that I think will help our worship. This is probably where I'm going to get in trouble, but stay with me. There's only four points, so we'll be good. Why do people sit at the 50-yard line in a game? Huh? They want to see the action. They don't want anything in their grill. They want to sit there, and they want to see it all. So I want to suggest to you, sit up as close to the front as you can. I, I know I can 
I can hear the hair going up on the back of some people's neck. You know, this building was, it's, 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 a, it's a great facility. But if there's anything I could do, I'd make the walls wood and chop about 25 feet out of that ceiling. It just sucks and absorbs our sound. But if we set up close, maybe, and again, it's not for us, maybe we would be giving something a little better to God. And maybe if someone wasn't in Christ and they heard us, they'd be like, that's, I like that. Glance at the songbook, glance at the PowerPoint, glance at Mike to see that we're all together, but seeing, church, seeing. I said last week, and, I, and some of you weren't here, so I'm going to repeat it. You say, but you don't know what I sound like. I don't care what you sound like. God says, sing and make melody in your heart to him. Is God pleased with that? Yes. That's what he seeks. He wants genuine. As people say, I just sing like this because I can't sing. Sing. That, uh, shut up. Go on. Point number three. Thank you, you sing. You ever been miles away? I've been, I've been light years away. I, on one time, I was at a place. I tell you, I was preaching. I don't have any idea, but all of a sudden, we're through with communion and we're singing a song. And I look up and I think, is it time for communion? Now, do you find it hard to stay focused? I do. You know, I, I try to get animated some up here, maybe to, you know, keep you a little bit, but it, it's hard to stay focused sometimes. I have to, you know, slap myself. Jerry, get back over here and get, get back where you should be. You know, that roast will take care of itself. It's in the pot or they'll still have food down at Del Taco when we're done. And then finally, make the choice to be happy. I, I shared this with some of you. I went to singing school this year, and they, I, I always thought I was a smiling per, per, per person. I swear I slept a clinger in my mouth, and I went around like this, you know, I'm so happy. And they videoed us, get up and sing, joy to the world. I was up there just, joy to the world. And so they, they just said, all they videoed your faces, you look at it, you go, oh, that's sad. Do it again. Now I'm aware of it. Joy to, and I didn't look much better. It makes me really sad because I'm happy inside. And I want to, you know, I may have to raise my hands and do this or something, but I got to get my face in tune with the rest of what I know inside. And it's a choice. We chose to be here today. You made preparation to be here today. We make choices. So choose to be happy. And then singing and worship is a really musical offering to God. God is so pleased. You know, I, I never got into the Old Testament because they stripped all the fat away. That belonged to God. But they fumed all this up to God. It wasn't viewed as destroyed at all. This, this, this burnt stuff is going up to God. It's a swat, sweet savor. God's going, I like that. And when you sing, God's going, I like that. So if I'm not participating, what does God think? So while we're singing, we confess him, the awesomeness of the creator of the universe, everything around us, we extol his magnificent name, we figuratively prostrate ourselves before him, we raise our hands in acknowledgement of what we're singing, or we may clap. By the way, did you know that Israel lost their Bible? For about 60 years, I think, and you can check me on that, but about 60 years they lost their Bible. Now, their Bible was only Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, but they lost it. They went into captivity. They've come back out of Babylonian captivity, and they discover it when they're working on the remodeling of the temple, and here's the result. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen, and then whammo, down on their face. That's a pretty, 
That's a big change. And listen to this. Uh, for almost 60 years, it was Manasseh that led him astray. He was a scoundrel. In fact, Manasseh is the reason they're going. They're done. His grandson, Josiah, how, how old was he? Anybody remember? Eight years old. He rips and tears down every idol and Azure pole, etc., and grounds them into powder. And God said, because when he when he had this scroll and he starts reading it, he just he can't believe it. He starts ripping his robe. Like, I'm I'm done. Where, where has this been? Here's the response of the people. Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people that had been weeping as they listened to the words of God. Is there anything in the word of God that ever causes you to choke up? I'm not saying you have to. I'm just wondering. I, I guess... I've never known what it was to not have a Bible in the house. I love the people's heart. When you can read the Word of God and what you're reading for the first time, and if you haven't read it all recently, then some of it might be the first time, but if you can read it and it tightens your throat, you probably got a good handle on what it is. Now, I'm not suggesting, I had to put this in there. I'm not suggesting you have to raise your hands. And I'm not suggesting you have to clap. But I'm suggesting some of you may need to raise your hands and some of you may need to clap. And if you do that, you do it. There's no one here going to say anything. It's your time in worship if it moves you and you feel like you need to raise your hands or you need to clap don't be intimidated but be genuine and real worship God in spirit and in truth all right it's important to get rid of self-centered ideas like bless me tickle me please me and entertain me cheer me dazzle me I mean I have people I was just dazzled really Finally, corporate worship and song should help prepare us to serve one another and to serve the people around us that we can be an influence for God. I am quite sure there are a few, but only a few people that I will be the mouthpiece for God that will all hear. A guy came by to sell me solar, and I finally did it. But afterward, when he left yesterday, he said, I'd like to study the Bible with you. So if that solar gets a soul to Jesus, I'll be happy if the solar is no good. He said, yeah, my girlfriend, I would like that. Now, pray about it. All right. Here's why Jesus says, I'm going to back up for you. He, just before he, he's going to die real shortly. He prays this long prayer in John 17. He's on his way out of the world. He knows where he goes. He, he first thanks God for let, allowing him to finish everything that he wanted him to do. And then he prays for his apostles and disciples that are there that are going to be left behind. And then he prays for us. And this is what he said. I will remain in the cosmos no longer, but they are still in the cosmos. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Bind us together, Lord. My prayer is not that you take them out of the cosmos, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the cosmos even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Where are you going to get the truth? Your word is truth. As, I, as you sent me into the cosmos, I sent them in to the world. Like the disciples, we live in the world. We're out of the world. And Jesus prayed a specific prayer. 
He said, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world because they're so needed to be in the world. But I am asking you, Father, to protect them from the rotten evil one. So I end. Do you need to be born of the water and the spirit? If you do, you leave here today absolutely free of sin. Everything you've ever done or thought is washed away. And you get the spirit of God. By the way, do you have a spirit? How do you know? I hear some of you talking and shaking your head. You got a spirit. You know how that works? No, but I know when it won't work. When you're dead. Do I have a spirit? Does it, so, so God joins his spirit. He lives in us. We're going to read it. We talk, did last week. Our body is this temple. He's here with us together in a special way. When we leave here, he doesn't leave a lick from us. We just go. And he's there. It's our tradition to sing this song. If we can serve you, let us know while we stand and sing.